because we'd like to do it as soon. I mean, not delay like we do sometimes take the walkthrough and then wait and take testimony, but I think we'll do as much as we can today with this. So if you would tell us what this bill is, what it does. Thank sure. you. Sure. Um, for the record, Helena Gardner with Legislative Council. Um, I believe you have in your folders H910 as passed the House. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, makes amendments uh, at the beginning of the bill to the Open Meeting Law and then thereafter to the Public Records Act. Um, so the first section um, amends uh, the definition section of the Open Meeting Law. It adds a definition of the freight. Um, maybe I should back up a second. Um, I don't know if you wanted to know kind of where this bill sprang from. It, it started as a set of proposals from the Secretary of, of State's office to the House GovOps Committee. Um, and then in their uh, work on the bill, um, they, they directed, uh, the committee directed um, the Secretary of State's office to work with the League of Cities and Towns. And so some of the uh, of what you're going to see um, reflects uh, work that the Secretary of State's office did with um, VLCT. Um, some really became the committee's own work, and then, <laughs> you know, so it's a little bit of a hybrid, but the genesis was a series of proposals from the okay. Secretary of State's office. Um, so the, the new definition is added on page one, uh, the phrase business of the public body. Um, that's a phrase that's already used in the open meeting law um, in, a, in a few places. And one of the key places that it's used is uh, immediately below in the definition of, of meeting. So, you know, the open meeting law applies to public bodies, but it also only applies to activities that constitute a meeting of the public body. And the existing definition of meeting um, talks about a meeting being a gathering, a quorum of the members of a public body for the purpose of discussing the business of the public body or for the purpose of taking action. So that phrase, you know, you can, you can have in a meeting just if you're discussing the business of the public body. Uh, it's a meeting even if you're, you're not getting together to take action under existing law. That's old language, right? Yep, and I'm, so I'm pointing out to you where the phrase, since it's going to be newly defined as a new phrase, business of the public body, um, pointing out one of the places yeah. where that, that definition <clears throat> applies. So the definition, and this is one of the, the areas where um, the League of Cities and Towns and the Secretary of State's office arrived um, at the language um, and then discussed it with me on the definition of business of the public body. It means the public body's governmental functions, including any matter over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. Um, the next change in the definitions is um, we, we just went over the general definition of, of what a meeting is, gathering of a quorum of the members of public body. And then under existing law, um, this committee worked on, on language um, years ago to say what a meeting is not, um, saying it's, it's not um, kind of the mere ministerial um, uh, uh, agenda organizing, just mere distribution of materials without actually discussing them. So that, that's existing law, it's just designated as B. So there's sort of, in subdivision A, the structure is here what a meeting is. Subdivision B is here what a meeting is not. And then subdivision C and D on page two is our proposed additions for more examples of what a, a meeting is not. And this is language that Secretary of State's office worked with Gwen Zakoff um, of the League on. And of course, it was reviewed and approved by the committee, but this reflects that um, compromise. So um, it says, meeting shall not mean occasions when a quorum of a public body attends social gatherings, conventions, conferences, training programs, press conferences, media events, or otherwise gathers, as long as the public body does not discuss specific business of the public body. So you see a little nuance there, which is uh, on, on the prior page that we looked at, 
talks about a meeting being a gathering quorum to discuss business of the public body, and this says, well, you have a safe harbor as long as, if you're at one of these events, as long as you don't discuss specific business of the public body, that at the time of the exchange, the participating members expect to be business of the public body at a later time. So as long as they don't do that, discuss specific business that they have, that they expect to be business of the public body at a later time. So if Senator Clapton and Senator White and I went out for dinner and I asked, did you get, have you gotten any letters from APRNs? That's doing business then, right? Because we have an OPR bill that has to do with APRNs. Um, so is putting so aside the legislative branch isn't subject to the Oh, okay. Right I forgot that. <clears throat> <Yeah>. All right. <laughs> well, we're on the, well, we're on the same committee, and we have to warn the work that we do, right? We're supposed to warn. Well, well it doesn't apply to us, but if okay. you're on the select board and you, yeah. you All right. go to talk about. I forget that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know all the substance of the of the discussion, the impetus for, for this language, except generally speaking, there, Gwen's and VLCT and the Secretary of State's office apparently get, well, they get hundreds and hundreds of questions every year about the open meeting law, and those questions fall into many categories. But some of the many of the questions are the nature of, well, we're getting training together. You know, there's a quorum of us, and we're getting training, and it's it's about you know generally how to do our jobs and things that we need to know about. But it's not, you know, like it's 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 not um, you know. We're, so we're we're talking about things that generally topically fall within the scope of something that might come before us, but we're getting training and informed on it, and so um, this is meant to. I believe was was intended to kind of provide a safe harbor um, that allows some um, training conference type activities or or even the social gathering context as long as it's not right. specific business that they expect to come before them. Get that. Got it. Um, the next safe harbor or ex I guess exception from what a meeting is. This meeting shall not mean a gathering of a quorum of a public body at a duly warned meeting of another public body. As long as the attending public body does not take action on its business. So just remember again the two part definition of meeting. It's discussing the business or taking action. And this says, well, you're okay as long as you're not taking action, you fall within the safe harbor. And I think, so it really cuts out what is otherwise a meeting if, if they discuss a business, but I think part of the rationale that they were okay with that, or the Secretary of State's, and they can testify to this, is that you're at another duly warned meeting um, of another public body, and again, they know more about the specific instances where this comes up, but I guess subcommittee, you know. It could come up at town meeting. Committees come to other committees, yeah. Not a town meeting. You could. You actually could. All of the Billings Park yeah, Commission okay. could be at town meeting. Mm -hmm. And there could be some subject about that might relate to it. And, and actually, the town, you know, everybody could vote on something that actually related to the business of that commission. I, I was thinking more about the, the select board goes to a meeting of the school board to talk about school safety. Yep. And, and they, they can talk about it there they and there are three of the members of the five go so there it is a quorum and they are discussing business that affects the town but they're not taking any action is um, okay. so so those are the the amendments um, to, to the definitions section of the open meeting law um, the next uh, amendment to the open meeting law on page three is uh, an, an issue that the Secretary of State's office brought to the committee's attention and they spent, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'd be exaggerating, say more than 10 hours of testimony and discussion on this, what ultimately boiled down to four lines here. Is that an exaggeration, Chris? I don't know. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> um, so this is to address the issue of serial communication, otherwise known as daisy chain communication. And it's when, um, again, keep having to go back to that definition 
of, um, of, of what a meeting is. A meeting is a, a, a gathering of a quorum of the members of a public body. So, you know, there's an existential question. What is a gathering, you know, in this day and age, <laughs> right? Um, could that be a series of communications that are not time, space, um, not, not exactly at the same time or in the same place? You know, can you have a gathering over email? Can you have um, a gathering um, uh, spaced out over several days. Um, there's no case law on those questions in Vermont. Um, you could see a court looking at this definition of meeting in a gathering of, of, a, of a quorum of the members of a public body. You could see a court saying, well, I'm going to look at the intent language of the open meeting law, um, which actually is it, it's not shown in this bill. Um, it's in the next section, 311. But you know that, that the open meeting law is about ho holding government accountable and saying we're not going to construe gathering to mean you have to be in the same time and place. Um, the, with the spirit of the law um, shouldn't allow um, a series of less than quorum meetings to be used to defeat the intent of law. So you, you could see a court going that way. Or you might say, uh, well, I think court saying, I'm going to go plain language. I think gathering means you have to all be together at the same place and time. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 just, I don't have any case law to point to in Vermont. I know that courts in other jurisdictions have wrestled with the issue <coughs> and have used phrase, vague phrases like t contiguity in time and space being sufficient for it to be, look at, you know, similar type definite, like not exactly the same language as Vermont, but similar definitions of meeting and saying, well, if the, if the communications are sufficiently close in time and space, we, we think that it'll look like a meeting and, you know, you kind of know it when you see it. So um, there's other states that have um, therefore, you know, wrestled <coughs> with this issue of when a less than, a series of less than a quorum communications is, is considered a meeting. So this can happen in a couple of well, uh, multiple different ways. So take a, for example, a five member um, select board and we'll call the members A through E. You could have A and B talking, B and C, uh, A and B, and then B and C. So just that's a simple example. Two different communications, separate communications, separated in time and space, but collectively those two different sets of communications involve a quorum because you've got three of the five members. Um, so that's that's an, the simplest, I think, example of a serial communication that, when you add up the, the who, who um, participated, it would constitute a quorum. Then you can have um, conversations happen through in intermediaries. So taking, for example, again the five-member select board A through E, A could talk to X, the intermediary. B could talk to X. C could talk to X, and X could, in a way, be coordinating and maybe lining up votes or lining up a decision on something all outside of a meeting. So those are some of the issues that the committee was wrestling with and that informed the development of the, of the language <laughs> on page three. So what it says is that a quorum of the members of a public body shall not use a series of less than a quorum communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries, so it does try to address the intermediary question intended by any of the members to reach agreement or take action on the business of the public body. So there's a lot to unpack in that one sentence, as you can see. Um, you know, notice the intent requirement, and that's not inten intended by all of the members who are part of what became a quorum. It's intent by any of the members and it's not enough for the intermediary, uh, the intermediary to be have that intent. You have to have a member with the intent. So, this seems like, to me, I'm sort of new to this. It <laughs> seems completely overboard. Is there a real problem that we're trying to solve here? Have there I, I, been instances of this as a challenge? Do, I think that that isn't Helena's issue. Oh, okay. Helena is I'm addressing the, the I didn't technical. Hear everything. Helena is walking us through the bill and is the technical drafter of the bill, I think we'll hear from other people about whether it's an issue and how the resolution came. Okay. 
But that if means I, I have to remember my question. <laughs> I, I just, I just, I don't want to yeah, put Elena no, in the sorry, position of defending question. or anything else. Do you have a technical question? Just a Elena? clarification. So <laughs> yes. if, if Claire and Allison and I were members of the Board of Aldermen in a particular city, yeah. and there's five members, so yeah. we, and I say to Claire, I think we ought to fund that um, at, at our next meeting. Will you check with her and see what she thinks? And so that constitutes a public meeting in in terms of this language, correct? Right. You're in, intending to if if you're intending to reach agreement or right. Um, Even though they may work. not be, I am. Yeah. Because I want her to ask Allison, and then I want to get the answers back. But maybe it's just preparing for that meeting where you're actually publicly going to make that decision. Well, I mean, I think it satisfies the language. But yeah, no, no, I, I agree. But it, what there seems to be a very fine line between prepping for something and thinking about it ahead of time and actually then taking a vote. Well, we will hear from people who testify both for and against these parts, but. Tech, Helena is the drafter. I get that. We ask technical questions and questions of clarification. Thank you. Um, the other, you could spend a lot of time on this language. The other thing I wanted to point out, it doesn't say intended by any of the members to discuss the business, which is, is part of the definition meeting. It says intended by the members to reach agreement or right. um, take action on the business. Um, section uh, three, um, this is where the shift to the uh, Public Records Act. Um, this adds a new subsection to the part of the uh, Public Records Act that's the statement of, of policy and the, the short title. And um, it, take, uh, it, it brings over, there's a provision in Title Three. Um, that, that is the provision of law that requires um, executive branch state agencies to have a records management program and improve record schedule. And in that section of law, there's kind of uh, foundational uh, intent and, and context language. But that section of law only applies um, in terms of the record schedule requirements to executive branch state agencies. So there was a discussion where one of the, um, not a member of House GovOps, but one of the representatives, Dylan Giambattista, um, you know, raised issues about, uh, in, in general, the importance of records management um, with, you know, in, in helping with the Public Act, Records Act um, being administered. So um, one of the thoughts was, and uh, recommendations, was to add the context and intent language about the importance of, of um, records in, in general into the Public Records Act. Um, and in H-585, the bill that you reported a couple of weeks ago include some of the, that added some other language to the Public Records Act about the importance of records management. So this is the other chunk of that language that was brought over from that provision in Title III. So, um, General Assembly finds that public records are essential to the administration of state and local government. Public records contain information that allows government programs to function, provides officials with the basis for making decisions, and ensures continuity with past operations. Public records document the legal responsibilities of government, help protect the rights of citizens, and provide citizens a means of monitoring government programs and measuring the performance of public officials. Public records provide documentation for the functioning of government and for the retrospective analysis of the development of Vermont government and the impact of programs on citizens. So I guess you could ca characterize this as sort of an elaboration upon the, you know, subsection A is about um, accountability of, of government and then this is more about the, is, is elaborating on, on what records can do uh, in terms of providing further accountability and insight into government activities. Um, section four relates to, um, uh, it's an intent statement about what's happening in section five of the bill. Um, and it's, you'll, you won't really know what section four is saying, I think, until you dive into section five. But it's saying in rearranging, in, in kind of moving text around in section five, um, we want to make the text, General Assembly wants it to make the text more organized and clear and doesn't mean to make any intent uh, substantive changes we're just rearranging things 
Um, section five is the section of the bill that I, I, I dread walking through. I dreaded walking through it upstairs and I, because there's a lot of moving and rearranging and then a few changes that are somewhat substantive but not earth shattering but there's a ton of underlying and strike throughs and whatever and you can only I think appreciate why that's helpful and needed if you look at existing law and see what a disorganized mess it is that will take uh, I mean it really is a mess <laughs> um, so that will take some time I know there's a lot of witnesses in the room I don't know if you want to kind of defer on that until uh, a later time in terms of seeing how all the movements kind of match would, up. What I would do is on this, just tell us where the substantive changes sure. are. Sure, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the key issue here, um, or the, the only real substantive change, is that there's different time periods for responding under the Public Records Act, right? So there's the, the general, um, the, the general um, standard of um, Bottom page five in subsection B, you can say, upon request, the custodian of a public record shall promptly produce the record for inspection. And that part doesn't elaborate on what promptly means. If you go further down, so you, you would think, because it's saying except that, that we're just gonna have a list of exceptions, but this section's so disorganized that it actually elaborates on what promptly means and says it means three business days, um, but then it can be extended to 10 business days, an unusual circumstance. Oh, but by the way, if it's in storage, it can be a week. It's, a, it's just everything's disorganized. And so there's actually multiple kind of points where a time period might be needed, okay? So you have a request. Now, a request can lead to multiple things. It can be, lead to we actually don't have any responsive records. Well, what's the time period with when, within which you have to tell someone that you don't have any responsive records? Another path that it can go is, we have responsive records, but we're gonna claim them as exempt. We think they're confidential or exempt. So there's the time period within which you have to certify that you're withholding or redacting records as exempt. And then the, the other option is that, yep, we have responsive records and, and we're gonna Respond to them, and then so there's that those that that time period. And have we changed the time period? I mean, is it a no. substantive change, or is it just moving it around so that it's yeah and better then, understood? Well, and and then there's the whole uh, issue of appeal, where um, if um, records are denied, and then you go to the head of agency and you appeal and you say mm -hmm. they shouldn't have been denied, and the agency says requester, you were right, we shouldn't have denied them. There's then what's the time period? For if if that denial is reversed on appeal, then you know how long should you have to respond? So what this does is this only talks about uses the three day thing yeah. apparently in connection with if you're responding right uh, existing law um, refers to uh, page six. You see struck through language starting on the fifth line. Such certification shall identify the records withheld on the basis of the denial. A record shall be produced for inspection or certification shall be made that a record is exempt within three business days unless otherwise provided in subdivision five. So the, it only kind of attaches three business days to the word prompt with respect to the denial or the disclosing. It doesn't clearly connect three business days to the reversal on appeal situation, the, um, oh, we actually don't have any records at all situation. So what this section does is at the beginning, it says, we're gonna say what promptly means, okay? And it's, it's on page five, it says, promptly means immediately with little or no delay and unless otherwise provided in this section, not more than three business days. So it's not saying unless otherwise provided in just subdivision five. Five allows you unusual circumstances to have 10 business days, but there's another subdivision that lets you have a week. So this says, unless otherwise provided, whether it's the week or the, the 10 business days, um, promptly means um, from receipt of a request on this chapter or in the case of a reversal on appeal, that's that circumstance, um, from the date of the determination on appeal. So then it uses that word promptly throughout, doesn't refer again to three businesses, you've defined it above, and it gets all of those 
touch points where you need a time period to to guide when when the responses okay. do. So that's that's mainly, and then the, just a lot of reor a lot of the strike throughs and underlines are just yeah, and I don't think reorganizing. Yeah, I wish I had this definition yeah. promptly when I was raising my children. <laughs> <laughs> Three business days. No, yeah. immediate. Yeah, I like that immediate okay. part. Oh. Okay, so have we gone to all the way to page nine? Um, nine. So now we're in, the, and then the other. Um, so that's the the substantive stuff about reorganizing um, and defining promptly. H is a new subsection, and this is substantive as well, H. because it says um, nine. It's a brand new subsection H, but in the middle page. Does a records officer designated by the head of a state agency or department pursuant to 3 VSA 218? That's the same section I was referring to earlier the, about state executive branch agencies having to have mm -hmm. records management program and, and schedules. Is they, it also tells them they have to have a, a records officer. So it says um, that officer shall be accountable for the processing of requests for public records received by the record officers, agency, or department in accordance with this section. Um, my understanding is this language was, was um, proposed so that the records officer, it doesn't say the records officer shall fulfill all the quests or personally right. search all the records and review them. It says shall be accountable so that um, I think the idea animating this proposal was that we want it to be not mysterious to requesters who they can get information from about the status of their request. So there's one person who's uh, accountable for the processing. Um, section six, this um, looks like it's making this major new thing, but this is codifying with a couple of um, changes, codifying session law. So I don't, this is before my time, but in 2011, Act 59 um, established this idea of a public records request system. And um, that was done as session law. And it, it lives, it survives, it's ongoing session law. So the idea is let's, let's codify it. Let's put it <coughs> in the statute. Um, so um, it rearranges um, or reorganizes the text um, a little bit um, and it also adds something new which is um, on the uh, bottom towards the bottom of page 10 and subdivision 2 it requires public agencies of the executive branch to post in a conspicuous location on its website a link to the location on the agency of administration's website where public records request system information is maintained. So um, the idea there was um, people in the public may not think that Secretary of Administration is, well, they're probably not aware of the repository, but if the different agencies have links to it and are able to um, access it through the di different agencies, they'll be more likely to find it. And the other difference on page nine from, from the session law, um, was that it requires the Secretary of Administration to post system information on the website of the Agency of Administration, um, and they testified that they're already doing that. I believe the testimony was that they do it uh, updated quarterly. Um, so this is codifying existing practice, but um, okay. this was not in that original 2011 session law. Any questions for Hannah? Yeah. Um, and at the bottom of page 10, section 7 repeals that session law. It's a little different, you know, so saying we codified it and changed it a little bit, so um, repeals that and everything takes effect July 1st, 2018. Any questions? Thank you. So I have on the list for today, I just have. Uh, Josh, Gwen, the Karen is here, Chris, I mean Chloe, and Mike Donahue, but I see we have town clerks here, 
Are, yes. do, are you, do you want to testify today? On the open meeting, no. Oh. H899. Oh, oh, you're, oh, okay. You're here for that. Okay, great. Thanks. And did you want to talk on this one? Please. Just okay, a just a few minutes. Okay, please join us and we'll get to the end of this. <clears throat> Answer your question. Oh, good. I'm listening. <laughs> I'm just gonna go above Jamie's head. Ah. Did you turn the heat up? I did. Can I'm they it? Can I give you my scarf? I have a scarf. <laughs> Didn't turn it up that much. We got warm. We'll turn it down. For the record, Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State, and thank you for taking up this bill. As Helena pointed out to you, this was um, an initiative of the Secretary of State's office, and I worked with um, Ledge Council and the Chair of House Government Operations to come up with some of these changes. And the reason we put these forward uh, was to address the problems that we hear about every day. We get all the calls, as you probably know. Um, we get a lot of calls about open meetings and public records and um, people trying to do the right thing and trying to interpret the law appropriately. We get calls from uh, the boards themselves, uh, from town officials, and from the public who are interacting with these boards with their local and state government uh, around open meetings and public records. And these, some of the things we put into this bill, uh, we're trying to really add clarity to the existing law consistent with the advice we've been giving people so they can find it in the law themselves. A lot of times they look at the law and they call us and say it's not addressed or what does this mean? We're trying to make it a little bit cleaner and clearer in the law itself and it's consistent with the advice that we give out and also consistent with the advice that the League of Cities and Towns gives out. Particularly if we start with the open meeting sections, serial meetings. And uh, I will say, Senator Clarkson, serial meetings is a real problem. We, we get these calls more often than we'd like and more often than you'd probably think that boards are sometimes working behind the scenes to get things accomplished so that when they show up at a meeting, all of a sudden the decision is made and no public discussion is had. And it's very clear to those attending that the discussion has already taken place. Yeah. So this is a real thing, it's a real issue, it's a real problem. And I so, think there are some other folks in the room who, would, who could probably give you some, some actual examples. So the action is public, but the, the decision making process That's is right. not. That's right, and the intent of the open meeting law is to give the public an opportunity to observe, um, to comment, to sometimes participate, and to know what their government is up to. And when it comes to a meeting and the decision it seems like it's already a done deal and it's just made on the record with no discussion, you've You've not involved the public. You've subverted the open meeting law. I'm not saying this happens a lot, but it certainly does happen. And we wanted to make very clear in the law that it's not okay to do that outside of an open meeting. If you're discussing the business of the public body or taking action on the business of the public body, it needs to be done in a properly warned and open meeting. And that was the, the reason for bringing forth that provision. And I know it's not in here because there isn't a change to it, but what's the penalty for subverting the public open meeting law? So there are enforcement provisions within within the law. Um, the Attorney General's office can bring a complaint, or uh, individuals can enforce the law through the Superior Court. And I'm not remembering off the top of my head what the penalties are, but it doesn't. I'll say it doesn't happen very often. But for an intentional violation of the law, there are monetary penalties for that. But there's also a, 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 an ability to, um, I don't want to say do over. Ask for corrective action. Ask That's for right. corrective You're action, right. which is probably, which we put in a few years ago, which is probably one of the best things. Right. Because sometimes they're not <clears throat> intentional. And you can but the intent of this language is to give yeah. boards some further guidance and clarity in the law. But it's not okay to discuss the business or in order to try to predetermined an action outside of an open meeting. And that can happen in a, in a number of different ways, whether it's in person, by email, through chain communications, through one person coordinating the effort. That's uh, a good example. Yeah, I mean, you can think of hundreds of them. Yeah, yeah. I've been at meetings where the, there was discussion, but it was so scripted 
that you knew very well, that everybody knew before they got in there. Exactly and then you what say this, and then you say that, right. and I'll agree. And, 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 and then you can disagree a little bit, and I'll just. Right. I'll look like I'll I'm shocked. Shocked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never happens. <laughs> The other um, portions of the open meeting law were to, to, to help um, give some comfort to the board members who are always calling us and saying, we're going to a conference together, we're carpooling together, is that okay, is this okay? To kind of put in some, some safe harbors, to, as long as they're not discussing the business of the board, um, that they can, they can do those things. And again, the, there was some nuance there, the specific business of the board, because they might get together for a conference or a training and be talking in general about board business, but not specific items. Um, so that's to help help clarify that um, in the public records act clarifying what promptly means is something that we, we felt was uh, important um, the rearranging that helena did as she went through this draft was really excellent we were, we were happy to see that and help a little bit in that um, making it cleaner and clearer again to read the uh, tie into the records officer. Every state agency has to have a records officer, so to tie in that person, there's a lot of, well, I don't, I'm not responsible for that record, I'm not responsible for that record kind of thing that, that people were complaining to us about. To tie in the records officer and make the records officer accountable was something we really supported. I think that was Representative Gian Battista who, who started that converse, conversation, and um, we brought in Tanya Marshall to talk about it a little bit in the state records management program. Uh, that was all good. And I will just point out to you that we started out with a few other things in this bill that we were advocating for, one of them being a, an open government ombudsman, a place in state government where you could turn for these kinds of questions and have them um, help you without having to go to court, without having to go through a, a superior court process, be able to have some power to adjudicate some of these battles that come up between the public and, and, and boards and state agencies. Um, the House Committee was really interested in that, uh, but we ran out of time, I'll put it that way. I think we ran out of time to deal with it. There were some objections and some questions about what the power would be, and also the cost of putting together um, a person in state government for people to go to. So while we continue to advocate for that, the, uh, the House uh, Committee cut it out and said they would actually support you continuing to talk about it if you found um, you had the time or the interest in talking about it, uh, an ombudsman. Sort of like our, our business portal mentor. So we could have a meeting mentor. Something like that, yes. Yeah. Somewhere to go in state government to get your questions answered around open meetings and public records. We serve that purpose, and VLCT takes those questions as well. Um, it does fulfill some of that, but this would be something more where you could have someone. Um, our, uh, an arbiter of disputes. The, this agency says it doesn't so apply. So I, I don't want to get into that conversation. Okay. Now until we get, I just I, yeah, I'm, no, I'm just, aware of other people who want to testify on what is in the bill. Yeah. And <laughs> no, it's not. No. Yeah. And yeah. what we might or might not get to. So if you have language, if you can get that sure. to us. And, the, the, and I hate to. No stop this conversation but um and, and we could talk all day about that ombudsman right and the last thing that did get taken out on the house side which i won't discuss but i'll just identify it for you <laughs> was that we were looking to codify a lower court decision that said you cannot charge for the inspection of records throughout the public record law you'll see there's a difference between inspecting and copying you can charge for copies there's some dispute over what you can charge for when you allow for inspection if someone wants to come see you. Well, it's like access. You can't charge for access. But there are significant costs that come with providing that access. That's the argument that was made on, on the House side. So say it's a really big records request yeah. or it's reviewing video. Um, and so you have to have attorney time. You have to have time gathering that up for someone to inspect. So there is a cost associated with really big requests and complicated requests and so that's why the house again supported the concept of, of trying to thread that needle but kind of ran out of time in, in being able to have a full discussion on whether you ought to be able to charge or not uh, for inspection of records so that's that's where it came from from the secretary of state's office we support everything that's in the bill now and uh, 
appreciate you taking a, a hard look at this and, and hopefully passing some much needed changes to the open meetings law and the Public Records Act. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Joshua Diamond, Deputy Attorney General. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about H-910 and about uh, access to open government. If I may take the liberty just to make a few opening remarks before I comment on a couple of the specific provisions of the bill. Uh, the Vermont Attorney General's Office supports open government and transparency. We recognize that to have a vibrant democracy, citizens must have access to the government, either through open meetings or access to public records. But at the same time, we must recognize that when people conduct business with the state of Vermont, um, they often provide very sensitive private information. And just by merely transacting with government, we're not waiving those privacy interests. And that is recognized in the public record statute at 1 VSA section 315, which states, all people, however, have a right to privacy in their personal and economic pursuits which ought to be protected unless specific information is needed to review the action of a governmental officer. And if I just may say, the Office of the Attorney General stands ready to work with this committee, other interested parties, to achieve that balance uh, of making government open and accessible, by, but at the same time recognizing that we have legitimate privacy interests that need to be protected. Uh, these are not just idle words. Uh, I think it is also reflected in the conduct of our office in 2017, our office received and processed approximately 115 public records requests. Um, in the first quarter of this year alone, we have received and are in the process of uh, completing 33. Could you say that one again? Your office got 115? 115. Is that, uh, where they, is that where public records requests go? I thought they- To his office. To, to our office alone, to the office of the uh, Attorney General. Actually, that's not probably very many. Well, it's one every three days. Um, and at this stage, we're on track to do about, um, we've already had 33 come in in the first quarter. And, and these can be sometimes very easy. You know, please provide us with a settlement agreement. Or in some cases, we could get um, extremely large and broad requests. If I may just give one example. In 2016, our office received a request for all documents reflecting all communications from nine attorney, assistant attorneys general and 30 miscellaneous organizations and individuals, including various public officials, Bernie Sanders, Senator Sanders, various lobbyists, and the Democratic Attorneys General Association. Um, to merely identify what records might be responsive in that universe, we had to hire an outside IT professional who identified over 13,500 potentially responsive emails when we started collating you know, the email chains and things of that nature, we were able to whittle that down to 1,129 email chains. And then, as you all can imagine, we're a law firm. And so we have ethical responsibilities under the rules of professional responsibilities, maintain our attorney-client privileges, work product privileges, and therefore, in our circumstance, we also have to go through the process of redactions to make sure that we are comporting with our ethical obligations. So as you can see, it can often be a time-consuming uh, and burdensome process. Nevertheless, we recognize that um, public records, public access is an important goal of government, and, uh, and we support that, but we need the policymakers to understand that that, that comes at a cost and a burden uh, to our office, uh, so that instead of sometimes spending our time devoted to uh, prosecuting criminal cases or defending consumer protection or the environment, we are uh, off doing other issues such as responding to public records. But nevertheless, in 2017, in responding to 115 public records requests, about one every three business days, or one every three days, not just business days, we produced over 10,500 pages of records. And uh, many more were reviewed to ensure that um, privacy interests were, were reasonably protected. And in further interest of transparency, our office now, uh, starting with 2017, posts its response, our response, to public records requests on our website so that 
Um, the general public understands how we're responding, what objections we may be asserting or exemptions so that uh, we are acting in a transparent way to the Vermont citizens and the general public. With regards to the specific legislation, um, we support the efforts to create clarity on the definition of a public meeting and the efforts to provide clarity uh, with regards to the procedures with which public records uh, are responded to and frankly they comport with how we, we conduct business to begin with. There's really just one section that we have some concern with and that's subsection, I believe 5H, dealing with the designation uh, of the public records officer as, as the person to contact. Um, So two things, we think as a matter of policy, the, the agency head should be the responsible party or their designee. As we understand the operation of this section is that we are identifying the individual, at least in our office, who is responsible to fulfill the archival or records retention responsibilities to also be responsible for the public records requests. And in our office, those duties are bifurcated and in fact, uh, all our folks, all our attorneys are expected to be able to respond to public records requests. Um, so we think it would be cleaner uh, and more reflecting uh, of the goal to hold our agency heads responsible for their agencies to have the agency head be responsible or their designee for the public records requests. But uh, within that in mind, uh, we support the, the changes. So just to understand your, the H sort of says a records officer designated by the head of the state agency. So you're saying don't make it just one person? Correct. And don't tie it to the person who is um, the archival, the person who's got responsibility for archival uh, records retention. Well, I don't see that here. But okay. that, that's the reference, as I understand it, to 3 to say, section 218. And I think the, the reason for that was so that people would know where to go, that there was one person to go to instead of 23 attorneys. But it, it, it doesn't have to be the same person. And, and maybe by saying either the agency head or their designee yeah. uh, would solve that problem, at least in the operation for our office. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chloe, are you, um, Karen, are you here in place of Gwen? Yes. Okay. Do you want to? Sure. Then, I think you're next on that. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Karen Horn. I'm with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And as you heard from um, Halili and Chris, this was a long, complex conversation in the House Government Operations Committee. And the bill is a compromise. I think that um, nobody got anything close to everything that they were hoping for in that legislation. But having said that, we are um, satisfied with the version that came over to, to the Senate and um, supportive of it. So that's really all I need to say at this point, unless you have specific questions. No. Clear. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Do you all have copies of that, or would you like? Because I made copies. Would you like of your copy? testimony? Yes. We do oh. not. Would you like? We love this. Can I have any back? Sorry. Wait, wait, wait. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good. Sorry. Peggy always says I had to bring copies for you all in judiciary, so I figured I'd uh, continue yes. to practice. Oh, right. yeah, that's the practice for all you can do. Oh, really? Okay, good. Well, um, you. you know, you can, we can see how much you want me yeah, to speak uh -huh. on this. Um, I know that you, you kind of were interested in seeing what was in the bill right now rather than, you know, kind of what we want to be in the bill. So this is, this is a, uh, and I will try not to read from this. It's the, probably the longest testimony we ever. Have a list. <laughs> um, you know, so I'll try not to read from this. So you all have this uh, written testimony. It's very long. Um, but basically, um, 
you know, we, we support the reforms relating to public records in this bill. Um, oh, and for the record, I'm Chloe White. I'm from the ACLU. Yeah. Um, you know, we, uh, we're concerned by some of the changes made to the legislation um, as from when it came out originally in the draft that Helena and Chris worked on. And we really feel the bill doesn't go nearly far enough uh, in meaningfully act addressing the real problems in obtaining public records at Vermont, in Vermont. Um, we understand, you know, that the, you know, when a big request comes in, it's really difficult for people to deal with. Um, we know, especially in small municipalities, small towns, it's difficult to deal with a big request. But I think a lot of times people have used big requests uh, as, uh, you know, saying, well, this happens a lot. This is, this is a lot. And I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think, you know, when we have a, you know, there's a special case of, you know, like uh, attorney, uh, the deputy attorney general talked about. You know, there's there's certainly a case to be made for for sliding for sliding costs or for you know extended period of time. But uh, I think for the most part, I don't think the requests that people are getting are so large as to make it the uh, make dealing with them the standard, basically. Um, you know, and, and as we know, access to public records, I mean, these are public records. It's in, it's in the word, it's, it's in the, that's the name of the act, is the Access to Public Records Act. And there's really a presumption that these will be open except for blank. Um, you know, and we have, you know, and unfortunately, we have a lot of issues with public records access in this state. And that's why the Center for Public Integrity gave us an F in access to public information. Um, and we have a ton of experience, just with the ACLU. This is not including, you know, other uh, nonprofits and reporters, all their the issues with getting records. But um, we're currently litigating a case against Burlington uh, Police, um, which refused a public records request for a video camera um, because they said uh, they can't redact the faces of the people in the video. So releasing the video would violate their privacy. But uh, the case is ongoing against those people, so they're their names are already out there and basically now the public can't have uh, access to a public record of an incident in which government misconduct is alleged. Um, <laughs> we just settled a case against uh, Department of Educa uh, Agency for Education for $30,500 um, where the agency refused to provide records uh, related to school safety um, and despite admitting that they possess the data. And uh, Superior Court in Rutland ruled in our favor and ordered them to produce the documents. Um, this is almost two years after the request was made. And not only after we won, then the settlement dragged on because there were misinterpretations. The agency interpreted uh, the statutes, uh, statute about attorney fees differently than we did, saying that anything, that only when you did things in court could attorney's fees, could we recover attorney's fees? Not before suing um, and not after during settlement, which is not usually how attorney's fees work. So eventually we were able to get, you know, $30,500. So people talk a lot about the expense and the time that it takes to provide public records. Well, it's also expensive when you get sued and you lose and you have to pay the money out. I mean, either the, you know, to avoid, avoid that kind of thing in the first place and avoid an expensive and, and taking people's time and spending time in a lawsuit. Um, of course, there was the BT Digger request for the EB-5 program um, where we sued the state. Um, the state eventually released some information. Um, when BT Digger asked for more information, the state said the request would cost $200,000. Um, and that we think the matter could have been solved a lot more quickly with less cost to state taxpayers had the state provided better explanations for redactions and the, had the state not asked for exorbitant fees related to relevant documents. We've in, attempted to investigate the state's use of automatic license plate readers. Um, uh, just this summer, Leah Ernst and I tried to file a public re records request to state police. We were told it would cost over $1,300 and would take several months to produce. Um, so even though they would re release the records, in effect, it's a it's a denial. Um, you know, we, we decided not to pay that, but you know, we, we I think that was more of a matter of principle than we didn't have the money. But imagine that people who don't have that money who don't you know have the resources the ACLU currently does um, and they want public records and this is an effectively a denial of seeing something that is public is supposed to be public from the government um, the city of Burlington has refused to let us inspect things for free um, which uh, as uh, as Chris talked about um, is is in a lower court decision that inspection should be free um, 
other agencies do let us inspect for free. That is, that's inconsistent, it's, it, that's hard. Uh, it's, you know, we don't know what the law is. Um, so that's why we were disappointed that that codification was taken out. Um, I mean, there are so many numerous problems we think Public Records Act. There are over 260 exemptions, Public Records Act. Um, there are more being introduced every year. Um, as you know, you talked before about the nutrient management plan, uh, the, you know, the exemption. Um, and again, we, you know, the... That would be added. Right, that would be added. That's another one. That's 261, 262. Um, I, I just received an email that um, Senator Starr would like to put it into appropriations bill. So, um, <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, it, so in comparison, the Federal Freedom of Information Act only has nine exemptions. Um, you know, difference of scale there. Um, we think they, we think agencies um, regularly misconstrue exemptions. We think they were, they exhibit a reflexive deny first response to records. So instead of saying, yes, I'll get you this record, let me just make sure that it doesn't go, um, you know, doesn't apply to any exemptions or any, excuse me, any exemptions don't apply. Instead it's, no, I'm not gonna give you this record. Let me search for the exemption so that I can, you know, that my denial is, is okay. Like this is what we're feeling that we are experiencing and that I think a lot of other uh, nonprofits, reporters, uh, just members of the public are having difficulty with. Um, you know, agencies don't consistently provide justifications for redactions and withholding. They engage in inconsistent and improper denial of ability to inspect uh, for free. Um, inconsistent, exorbitant fees for record production. Uh, there is a nonprofit that is looking to understand what people, what some towns and districts are doing to mitigate mosquito problems. And they've been told it'll cost them two to three thousand dollars just to get the records. And that part of the problem is that uh, all everything is in hard copy instead of electronic. Um, so it's going to take them time to redact. So that's also a problem of records management. We feel, um, you know, we that's, you know, these are supposed to be public documents. Why aren't we preparing them in a way that they are? It's at least easier that when if the public requests them, it's easier to get it to the public. These are I mean, this is this is our government. Um, you know, it's question yeah, Chris. I see that. No. Please. Oh, I'm okay. And I think also, you know, I think one of the we do appreciate the definition of promptly in here because um, I think Secretary Condos has talked about this as well. Is right now there's just, um, agencies and towns are supposed to have three days to respond with ten days in, in special circumstances, but they will they will tell people. Um, I think Secretary Condos told me a story about. It. They'll say, "Oh yeah, we have 13 days to reply." No, you have three. Day, you're supposed to have three days and ten days in special circumstances, but instead they take. The, I mean, it's inconsistent. Um, and so I've listed, this is on page three and four, I mean, a huge amount of uh, uh, changes that we would recommend to Public Records Act. Um, I know it's April. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had a long Some session. That's true. Um, but we really think this is, it's important. It's, you know, these, these are public records. We know it's difficult. And we know, you know, a sliding scale is for, for larger requests, um, you know, I think is entirely possible or maybe longer time for a larger request. Um, you know, we, we understand that, that there is, you know, that, that there are times when a request is enormous. You know, you, you, you ask for every time someone said the word the in, you know, 20 years of email. Uh, that's, I mean, that would be... Death by avalanche. Right. But, you know, there, there are also things that we can do to make it better. You know, making all exemptions subject to a sunset. Uh, you know, with so many different things that we can do. Um, and we think that these extreme and unreasonable records requests that people are talking about, that they're few and far between. And we think that improper denials are valid requests or uh, basic or things that end up being denials of requests, so huge amounts of money, are, uh, are entirely too common. So, you know, we just, I, as I told you, we settled that agency of, of education case for $30,500. Next week, we filed that Burlington PD case. Um, we and other requesters are going to, we feel like we'll be forced to continue doing that until this deny first mentality is addressed. And so we would urge you to, to really think about public records reform, to try and come up with, to amend this bill to reform the PRA and increase the ease of access to public information. I would, I, Clara's question, Krista. 
Allison, but first I'm going to suggest that you, I suggested to you that you bring in language. Bring in yep. language. I've got it. Yep. Okay. For sure. And then we'll then we'll ta start taking testimony on on the language instead of yep. taking testimony now on right. what could be because we need to see the actual language. Absolutely. Claire. Oh, thank you. I wondered. I, you, you said Senator Starr was going to put something in appropriations, and I forgot what that was. Is nutrient that the nutrient, nutrient management, management plan or nutrient yes. management? We, you discussion. said that last night. We knew that. Yeah. Okay. I did. I just went back. I'm behind the hearing. Oh. Chris. Yeah. Chris. Um, I'm trying to. I, to me, I think there's a balance between, you know, a tiny town with a volunteer select board and. The agency of transportation and and I you know you mentioned Congress federal government did you say they have nine exemptions mm -hmm. I guess I'm I'd be curious to better understand those because I have a feeling that they just organize them better <laughs> right so we have 260 but I bet we could make that into about 15 in in principles uh -huh. one of them in Congress is every member of Congress and their staff right. so that's a pretty sweeping one mm -hmm. um, you know, and and I've had a lot of I've had not a lot I've had a handful of records requests. Mm -hmm. I have no staff. Right. I so I then spend time. You talked about the cost. Secretary of State's office, as I understand it, pegs the cost at twenty-seven bucks an hour. So the once to me came when we were out of session. So I'm not getting any money. In fact, I'm losing money <laughs> because I'm stopping my paid work mm -hmm. to comply with this. In every case, they went absolutely nowhere. It was a complete fishing expedition, mm -hmm. and so I, this is this is where the, really? there's a balance. And I, and I, I don't yeah. know. I, I'm very sympathetic to um, trying. You know, there's a, a really important principle mm -hmm. of transparency and openness, mm -hmm. and you know, I also try to recruit candidates from time to time, and it's really hard to get people to try to do this job. Oh yeah, and when faced with headlines about these kinds of, you know, the more you, <laughs> mm -hmm. the more you consider being in public office, the more harassment you are putting up with. Um, and I'll just, you know, be frank about that. And, and so I guess I'm, I'm not hearing um, a place where you're seeing the balance there. I'm hearing, and you make a very compelling case that nobody should be charge $200,000 for something uh, that's in the public interest. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I don't think that I should have to set aside money of the two-thirds of the year that I'm not serving to get 27 bucks to spend painful hours combing through email. One time I had one from a member of the press because I stood up on the House floor and demanded emails from the Trump administration that was, oh, that was the precursor of the $200,000 request. Mm -hmm. And somebody in the press thought it would be hilarious to then send me a request. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, never, never, uh, you know, no, no, what's the, what's the phrase? No uh, good deed that goes unpunished. So I went to council and I said, I want to turn all of these over. I'd like to do it today. Can we do that? And council said, I, I said, I got nothing to hide. It's in my legislative email. It was a four month window or something. And council said, well, you should be careful because some people, I was on the health care committee at the time, some people would send me their health care yeah. mm. stories. Right. So that was well, not, I, I mean, I could have replied, I could have copied it and pasted all those emails in an hour. Mm -hmm. But actually it took some time to make sure, and there were some mm -hmm. some emails in there. And, mm -hmm. and so it took the week. <coughs> yeah. and, and so my point is like, how do you find the balance? Can I suggest that if we could get some language from yep. Zoe, from Chloe, Zoe, Fine. from Chloe, that Sounds some of the some of these do talk about the balance, and and we and we are the ones that make the decision about where the balance is. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that's our job. That's our job is to do that and to say, but just kind of in the abstract, it's hard to. It's hard to yeah. look at these because we don't have actual language. Right. So you know, I'll, I'll I, just to say that that member of the media, 
admit it when I handed him the thumb drive. He said, oh, I just wanted to see if you would give Jeez. it. And you yeah, would I was like, well, yourself? all right. Oh my that's, God, I but I don't think that serves the public interest. Right. Well, you know. they, but most requests aren't like that. Most requests for public interest. 100% of the ones that have come to me, I guess I'm lucky. <laughs> <I'm laughs> oh, can, right. can I comment oh. on the number of exemptions we have? We. You're the chair. I, I feel very, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we took three summers to go through every single exemption. And we could easily have put them into 15 or 20 categories, and they would have been very broad mm -hmm. categories. And they wouldn't have been less exemptions, mm -hmm. but they would have sounded like less. And so people would have said, oh, we had 260 right. and now we've got 15. It wouldn't have made diddly squat difference at all. They would have still been the same exemptions. You have those notes? Oh yes, we do. We went through. We took three summers and went through every single exemption. I read all those reports over the summer, so it I, was, I appreciated that. Well, you must have had more So it was great. A any, anyway, I'm just saying that I don't think the number of exemptions yes. is indicative of anything, except for those people who do these reports and say you have 267 exemptions, and so therefore you're bad. Mm. And I don't care what those reports say ever. Just to put that on the record. <laughs> Allison. I want to know what state got an A. That's a great question. New Jersey, New Jersey. Jersey. Uh, Florida. Florida. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. Florida. 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 So that just proves the point. That right. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, so, you know, it's. Oh. So you get an A. And they, uh, yeah, you know, the, the, there's a Sunshine Act. I think it's, you know, someone has explained to me, you know, there is, there is this trend of Florida man, you know, Florida man finds Badger and hugs it and gets a $300 fine. Some odd story, and you know, it's always a Florida man, Florida woman, and it's because of their very expansive Public Records Act that things are very open there. Um, but yes, Florida gets an A. Um, I think, uh, That's about all yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. New Jersey did quite well, I remember. They did quite well in ethics. Right. Oh, was it ethics? Yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. ethics. Yeah. That's surprising. Yeah. Any other questions for Chloe? But I would well, suggest that you, language, yeah. you have some language on these because some of these really are very legitimate and should be addressed. Absolutely. I mean, they're probably all very legitimate, but I, well, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Mike? Yeah. <clears throat> well, we ended up not. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Donahue. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Press Association. Also here today representing the uh, New England First Amendment Coalition. Um, generally uh, very supportive of this bill. Agree with a couple of people. It doesn't go quite far enough, but I figure we'll take a half a loaf. Anytime we can keep getting a half a loaf, so I. It's not, I, so I, it's not the nutrient loaf. Yeah. Oh. It's, no, it's, it's, it's a good it part. Nutrient. But uh, I mean, I I am supportive of some of the things that the ACLU said, and I'll touch base on it. Um, and in answer to, and, and I support what uh, Chris said about the whole purpose of, of meetings is to have things hashed out in the meetings. And uh, Senator Clarkson, you asked about, you know, is that a problem? I'm, there are a lot of meetings, and, and I'll give you one example, where chairman of the select board, and I couldn't believe he said this, um, I asked him about something and he said, well, I, uh, I sent an email to each of the selectmen and they told me how they felt. I said, really? You know, and he goes, yeah. He said, and then I called them and we talked. And so they, they took action on something, an appeal. And I said, well, why didn't you have an emergency meeting or a special meeting or anything like that? And then it's a long case, but then they retroactively went back and corrected minutes of a select board meeting from like two months earlier and amended the minutes to say that they had done all this stuff. So, I mean, 
it is outrageous some of the things that you see that they orchestrate outside the meeting and then you come in and everything is already choreographed and everything like that so um, um, we are excited that the word promptly finally is sort of going to be defined for governmental officials uh, uh, it was always interesting that uh, I always tried to contend that that meant forthwith, like right away, like right now. I'm coming Spin into, so, yeah, you know, you, five days. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, is, and and I would say to people promptly, like if your house is on fire, are you going to report it promptly? <laughs> are you going to wait two or three days, or are you going to call the fire department right now? I want it promptly. And uh, if several of you remember, I mean, it was two days, and we expanded it to three in one of the compromises to get some of the other things for transparency. Um, the um, we do support the concept of of not charging for inspection. Um, we think if somebody wants to go in and read minutes of a select board meeting, they should be able to read them. Why would you charge to go in to a <coughs> uh, city hall or town hall and look at the town recreation committee or whoever's minutes or any sort of governmental records that are common? Um, democracy costs money, and there's no two ways about it. And you have to invest some money, and we would. Uh, I know everybody likes to talk about the OJ case and the big case like uh, uh, Josh mentioned there is that big, those big cases that come along every once in a while but also when you changed the law a couple years ago there was a, the potential of mm -hmm. negotiating with the person the law was silent to that for many many years and people thought because the request came in you had to do what the request was mm -hmm. and you changed the law thankfully so people can call up and say, what is it you really want, Mike? And I'll say, well, I'm really, I think I'm told there's a contract about this. Oh, okay, I'll send you that, right. you know? And that happens an awful lot. But there are fishing expeditions, and I'm sorry, you were subjected to a fishing expedition of, and I think I know who it was. No, we've had them too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 yeah I'm not, I'm not oh, saying he not was, he, you know whatever but uh, um, and you seem surprised a little bit that the AG's office had 115 complaints I don't know if that was no, a lot or a low request yeah, request. Uh, request, request. Or request for yeah every three days uh, you know, which is not yeah that's pretty yeah. long I mean that's yeah. that's and, and if you look at the record Josh doesn't think that no, no if you look at the record you need a staff for it that's basically a full-time staff. Yeah, that's a huge well, job providing us all the time. This, some of the requests could have been, can you send me the minutes from a meeting you had, or could you send me this one thing? Some and, of and them the, can be answered in about 20 seconds. That's so, true. And some of them are yeah. gigantic. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, I went on and I looked at a lot of the uh, records that were asked. I mean, there's cops putting in requests can you tell us about such and such a company? So law enforcement is actually using it mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, going to the EG's office. And I mean, yeah, we were sort of surprised to find law enforcement doing Aren't they it. supposed to be investigators? Can't they do that one? Well, That's no, what they're I, investigating. They're asking you know, for records. They they want they wanted to know about the pool company in Woodstock. You know. Do you have any complaints about? And, and there's a lot of consumer oh, I see what fraud. You mean. That is what you look. okay. There's a lot of consumer yeah. fraud complaints can, where right. people were writing in. Can you tell me if you've got it against Donahue Pool yeah. and Spa yeah. Company? You know, those are, I won't say a lot, but a good number I saw when I was going through that. And if I may, Madam Chair, there, there's a redaction process. So even right. though it may be a simple request, there's work that has to be. Right, we we understand that, and I, I don't want to get into the discussion about how many is good and how many is bad. We have yes. thousands and thousands yeah. and thousands of public requests, rec record requests every year, and 
from all the agencies and that we have a report on that every year of how many there are and there's thousands and thousands of them most of them very legitimate and well defined but we can get the report if anybody wants to read it uh, I'm not exactly. Federal. Open Federal. meeting. We're exempt from open meeting. We're not exempt from public records. All right. Okay. All right. But you just and and just I wanted to back up on working with with people. I, I'll I'll give you one example. I I did a uh, public records request. I wanted to find the worst drunk driver in Vermont history. Okay. And the DMV records were pretty lousy because everything was computerized and it would only show anybody who had D, a DWI three or more. So if you were, were caught a fifth time, it was DWI three or more on the computer. Or if it was seven times, it would show DWI three or more. So the free press bought, I think it was 675 driver's licenses records for anybody with DWI three or more. And that was the only way we were able to write the story that a guy had 16 DWIs in Vermont. Huh. So, you know, and, and, and it was, you know, that's what changed the law because they were all misdemeanors and then now you change right. the law so that DWI three is a five year felony. Yeah, this would no longer be possible. But it's, but it, there was negotiation there. I didn't hold them to, you've got three days, I want, 625 records I mean and and I think a lot of times people will work with them when it's realistic and everything like that so uh, so I guess th those are just some general comments I'd make uh, uh, you know there are a few things minor things that I may submit but On the word here we have in front of us uh, yeah. or that you would like to add well I'll give you one that uh, on page one, uh, at the very bottom, B, when it talks about meeting, um, shall not mean, shall not mean written correspondence, electronic communication, email, and then uh, I think it's uh, on, uh, and, and and it says, as, as long as it's available for inspection and copying under the Public Records Act as set forth. And I guess the question becomes, if there's phone calls, how do you get public records out of that? And, and I guess we would like to see something possibly inserted there where it says, it shall not mean written correspondence, electronic communication, including email, telephone, teleconferencing between members for the purpose of scheduling a meeting, organizing an agenda, so forth. No issues of, of uh, substance shall be discussed. If you could add a phrase like that, that no issue of substance. I Just to make it clear. Means. It's only for scheduling a meeting, organizing agenda, or distributing materials. But, but it would be great to add that because I think that's what happens. You get on the phone and you start talking oh, okay. And, okay. And, and you're talking about the agenda and then as Brian okay. said. Would you put that, would you have some language for that? I, yeah, I mean, I just, okay. no issues of substance shall be discussed, but I'll, I'll put it in writing to you. Yeah, because we need to know where exactly. Yeah. I just, um, I think it was Betsy who determined that we would just decide what could be discussed or what could be done instead yes. of having vague language that could include a lot of stuff that couldn't happen. For example, it was in a different bill, but for example, no issues of substance. That is enormous. What you decide is important might not have felt important to me important? when I discussed it. Like, are you going to be at the something or other meeting next week? So I, you know, it, see, it seems that keeping it clear that it's for the purpose of, dis, of scheduling a meeting or organizing an, an agenda or distributing materials seems pretty explicit about what can be discussed. I mean, you could you could put a thing that, instead of, of substance, you could put a thing in that refers back to the 
definition at the beginning of business of the public body. That makes whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. But whatever. The, yeah, that oh, yeah. it should be taking place at these meetings and not in these yeah. serial meetings by phone or whatever. Anything else for Mike? Okay. Anybody else comment on this today? So we'll take this up again next week. If everybody can have their um, any suggestions for changes to us, uh, so that we can post them, so that then people will know what we're going to be talking about. Like a public record? No, <laughs> going to keep it private. Yes, well, it no, is a public know, record. It's a joke. <laughs> I know that was a joke. <laughs> yes. Do you, you know, I hear. You state clearly that you don't care about the the rankings we get, and, and I don't no, care about the what? The rankings we get. Oh. And I don't care about the rankings per se, but I mean, I, a state. Yeah, uh, but I think that it is. In, I mean, we saw it coming up in the OPR bill around law enforcement. Like we we added one more. We said they don't have their home address. Right. But, uh, you know, but OPR told me that they're considering a blanket exemption that the professionals they license we don't right. there it's not it wouldn't be a, a it wouldn't be whatever it'd be an exemption right. for their home address for all right. of the professionals right. so um, I guess I am intrigued by the idea of better categories that um, we might look at maybe it's too big a lift in the short time we have left but oh, we can't I don't think we could do it it took us three years to go through the the ones that we had, and they and and I believe that now they are put in categories, but they're not. So there's a category that deals with um, trade secrets, and there's a category that deals with personal um, information like exemptions. Yeah. They're not, and then each of the exemptions that relate to that are put underneath that, but they're not. It's not broad categories that we've just gotten rid of all the exemptions on. Um, yes. With the chair's permission, I'll provide yes. a, a, a visual here. Um, I have a small laptop, but under on the website, under reports and research, there's uh, over to the right, PRA exemptions, PR ex exemptions in order, and PRA exemptions by subject, so they're organized by subject. So the different subjects include um, com kind of complaints and investigation, um, Type stuff and then, okay. yeah, and then you have uh, records oh, related yeah. to judicial or administrative proceedings, and then it's further broken down there: adoption, court diversion, and so on and so forth. And I also have a, a table of contents for this, but anyway, it's updated; it has okay. to be updated um, every at least every two years. Sorry. And, and then, in, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. <laughs> if you collapse that, how many would there be? Yeah. Um. So. You can see um, in the other um, part of the tab, PRA exemptions in order. These are just the statutory exemptions, okay, in the Vermont statutes annotated. So there's the possibility of additional exemptions if a rulemaking authority is so broad as to allow the creation of an exemption in a regulation. It could be there. That's not captured in this list. And then there's the kind of the the mega exemption, which says, C1 says, uh, records are exempt if they're designated confidential by law, which can include federal law. So this list doesn't try to get a, a list of federal exemptions, but this list here was most recently updated and um, republished in December, and there's uh, 253. 12 pages. Now 253 exemptions. In the statute. But and there's probably but 24 categories or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we could. A whole pile of them are trade secrets. So, okay. Yes. I, I take it. Yeah. It's just yeah. too big. But it, it is. We're going to forever be. This is going to just keep going back as long as we have this eye catching number. That's all I think. But whatever. Yeah. I, Hopefully we don't. And I don't know how else. Yeah. To do we don't want that. We could just say all, all trade secrets. Are I mean all um, business? What do you call them? 
trade, yeah. trade secrets, but it's proprietary. anything proprietary, proprietary that would put you at a competitive things. disadvantage to someone else. That's that's the key. It isn't necessarily a trade secret. Like uh, it's something that would put you at a competitive disadvantage to somebody else. We could put that in one category and just take that one statement, and then it isn't clear at all, and people would have to say, let's see, does this, they requested the nutrient management plans. Would that put them at a competitive disadvantage? If you had a specific no. exemption or not, then you would know that it was exempt or it wasn't exempt, but the way, if you put it under that broad category, then, then somebody would make the decision, yes, this would put somebody at a competitive disadvantage. And then the person that requested it would say, no, it doesn't, I don't believe it does, and then they would have to go to court to have it settled. That's the way, I, I think that's the way it would happen if you had broad categories instead of specific exemptions. Just to, I mean, there is a broad trade secret exemption, mm -hmm. and um, it's a part of a list that starts off by saying, here are the records that are exempt. The following public records are exempt from public inspection copying. It doesn't say the following records are exempt and shall not be disclosed. Mm -hmm. It says here are the records that are exempt. And there follows a list that seems to include records where you would really want the agency to have the discretion whether or not to claim the yeah. exemption. And then there are things that you can't conceive of you think it would be bad if the agency didn't claim the exemption. But they're all in the same list combined yeah. together. And it doesn't provide a lot of, and, and so the, the trade secret is, is a standard, it's a test, mm -hmm. just as you articulated. And there's prongs to that test, and reasonable minds can differ about how those prongs of the test, whether they're satisfied in a particular case or not. So that's the kind of the broad trade secret exemption. And all these parties, that want their own mini narrow nutrient management plan or whatever, say, well, we don't want to have to duke it out or fight or have any uncertainty about whether it qualifies under the test. We want to make a clear, direct statement that, that it's covered. So in a way, if you look at, like, if you think in terms of Venn diagrams, like circles within circles, you could say C9 is this circle, and then there's all these little mini ones inside there that probably already are covered under the broad C9, but by having them specifically spelled out, they provide comfort to certain people in certainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of those exemptions also say they're exempt and shall not be disclosed <laughs> or shall be kept confidential. They explicitly say that. And if I remember, a lot of the trade secret ones came through DFR, ACCD, mm -hmm. um, or someplace else. Because how we get people to do to go along with a lot of the regulations we wanted to put in place for one thing or another. We had to promise we wouldn't disclose it. Well, well yeah. That's that was the with beginning. ACCD, they yeah. apply for loans and grants, and they put things in there that yeah, their finance information in their application that certainly would be detrimental to them if they got it. If it got <coughs> so. so, any more questions on this? We'll do this again next week, and um, hopefully have some language and we can, <coughs> but what I understand is that the bill as it is, nobody objects to the things that are in there. They would like to see more things in there, but did I, did you object to something that was in here? Oh yes, the, the one, one person. That's me. Yeah. I think to accomplish the same goal, yeah. but, uh, allowing the agency yeah. Had to be responsible. What does it mean? Yeah. Well, it, it isn't the head of the, the agency. It's a records office designated by. But the records the management yeah, officer doesn't have to be the same as the public records officer. That was, yeah. Okay. Is this the bill that started as having a person be like? Well, that's what they wanted as ombudsman. The meeting mentor. Well, they had a, it was more than a mentor. It was a they had some kind of judicial, quasi-judicial um, authority, and it was far more than just answering questions. Like New York and Connecticut. Yeah. All right. So.
let's move to the next.